Halloween Han is now open at King's Island, and this year there's a new product that can enhance your experience. Hello, everyone. Alongside Ryan Sir, I'm Don Helbig, and this is Tower Topics. Tower Topics is a podcast by King's Island fans for King's Island fans, because that's who we are, and that's who we care about. So, Don, uh, this came as a surprise, but also not a surprise in a couple of different ways. Uh, I, I didn't see this coming. But with that being said, they had a similar product at Winterfest, which I think went over pretty well. Uh, and they also have had something similar at Knott's Berry Farm for a couple of years. But now they have uh, these interactive lanterns at Kings Island. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that because I did have some experience with it. But right off the bat, you purchase the lantern either online or at the park. Uh, $39.99. You can get your season pass discount on it if you are so inclined to have a discount like that. But um, yeah, before we start, like, what what did you see as far as when you were walking around the park and you weren't with me, so you didn't get the personal experience of lanterns, but did you see a lot of people with them? I did see a number of people with the lanterns. And you mentioned, you know, you can buy it online or at the park. Let me ask you, if you bought it online, do you just go to the park then and pick it up? That is my understanding. Yeah, you you get some sort of ticket or something like that and they just give it to you at the park. Yeah. But like you said, you know, there were, was a number of uh, guests walking around, you know, with it. Uh, the chatter that I heard from guests in the park or what I've seen online is that it does enhance the experience. They find it uh, pretty cool. So, so Ryan, how does it work? So uh, there's actually four different functions to these lanterns. And this, this is cool because this isn't something that's advertised, but so this whole episode, by the way, is a spoiler alert, uh, alert warning, because we're going to talk about the interactions that the lantern does, as well as some, you know, cool Easter eggs and stuff. But uh, the number one thing that it does is it uh, it interacts with the environment. There's interaction points. This is my friend Noah. So Noah loves Tower Topics. So thank you for being my uh, model, Noah. But uh, having a little trouble following directions here. But uh, so you use a lantern, you can interact with these things uh, for the one that he's doing right now. For those of you not watching it, there's a screen that's in the um, uh, that that's uh, in the Emporium. And when you scan the lantern, uh, eventually the screen, which has a, a static picture of a clown, it comes and like jumps at you. So he, he eventually gets it. But um there are other touch points. Uh, now, this is another thing that you and I didn't discuss in the new stuff for, for Haunt that wasn't really discussed. So Tower Gardens is all themed to um, Edgar Allan Poe. So one of the, the lantern interaction points is the Telltale Heart, where um, you know Edgar Allan Poe writes the story of a guy that killed somebody and hid them under the floorboard. So you scan the lantern and it starts telling the story and then you hear thumping and stuff and a light up heart from inside that box. So it's really cool. But um, so obviously it's got the interaction points. The second big thing that it does is it does uh, it interacts with scare zones. So you walk through the scare zones and the lantern will often match the design language of it. So uh, for example, if it's, I think Coney Mall often does the red and white lights. So it flickers red and white while you're in Coney Mall. Really, really cool. Um, another thing that it does that a lot of people don't, necessarily know about is that there's actually a game mode where you, you hit the button on the front and you can tag other lanterns so you see somebody come by you press the button as a trigger and it'll start, make their lantern start flickering like crazy but here's a real cool thing i, I didn't know about this but uh, somebody told me about this a little insider information but the lanterns can be activated by certain scare actors Certain ones can make them change color or flicker or turn off or whatever. They've got some sort of button as part of their costume that they can hit and they can affect the lanterns around them. But so there are two really, really cool uh, touch points, uh, interaction points that I really like. So skip ahead about two minutes if you don't want to hear it. But uh, the first one is uh, at the bat's exit. If you if you scan the lantern, it's got like a bunch of rubble that looks like Son of Beast parts. It probably is Son of Beast parts, to be honest with you. Um, and you start hearing things like news clips and stuff about Outpost Five and whatever. And finally, you start hearing some rumbling and flashing, and it's coming from the old Beast Station. 
it's really cool. So it's almost like a three dimensional kind of kind of thing since the audio is coming from all the way back there, and it's really neat. But the best one is that in the front of the park at the haunt sign, like the, the ID marquee sign, if you uh, scan the left side of it, it makes the eyes on the Eiffel Tower change color. They'll either blink or they'll look bloodshot or they'll like fl flash different colors. Really, really cool effect. Uh, the one on the other side, by the way, is a car horn, which is super annoying, but Noah seemed to enjoy that. But um, yeah, here's another one. You know, you see you can make that animatronic go off and stuff. They had something similar to this at Knott's Berry Farm last year. But m my understanding is that this is a new generation of stuff. So uh, they're able to do more with it. But I will say this. We used this thing for every bit of four hours and had so much fun with it. So you're going to have naysayers out there that are like, oh, it's a cash grab. It's not worth the money. Well, those people weren't going to spend the money anyway. If you attend Han, especially if you attended a lot and you really enjoy, uh, you know, technology and new things and surprises, this is definitely something for you. What I like about it, Ryan, you know, the way you're describing it and what I you know, can, can tell from this video and that is just that, you know, it's, it makes Halloween Haunt, you know, an interactive experience. And I, I think that's a really good thing. And it keeps you entertained. You said you used it for four hours, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, you were obviously you were entertained by it to want to keep using it that long when it's only a six hour event. Right. So uh, I can see where this really you know, really, you know, makes makes a night at Halloween haunt, you know, just this changes the, the dynamic of it. It's a different experience for you when you've got this than just your normal night there going through mazes and scare zones. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it's, of course, you know, the houses are pretty much the same. The scare zones you can only do so many times, but this is something that's pretty much brand new. Um, now, one thing I do want to point out, I didn't know this going into it. I found this out once Haunt opened, is that this is an event that's Tricks and Treats and Haunt and both. So there's some of these interaction points that only work during Haunt. There's some that only work during Tricks, or tr tricks and Treats. And there are some that will work either at Tricks and Treats or Haunt. Here's the kicker. The ones that work at Tricks, tricks and Treats and Haunt don't necessarily do the same thing during the day versus at night. How cool is that? So you can do the whole experience twice, essentially, in one day if you want to. I like that. I mean, it's, you know, it's a different way to experience the event. You know, we hear that a lot of times is you go to Kings Island during haunt. You know, it's like you're going to see the park like never before. You know, you hear the park talk about that all the time. But this really allows you to do that. It really does. Now, I want to point out for those of you who are watching, uh, this one is one of my favorites, too. So it's two of the Area 72. There's sideways footage. That wasn't smart of me. But uh, two of the Area 72, um, uh, I, I, they were the things from the fountains, I believe. But you scan them, and it, turn, it turns on an alarm, and they start spewing out fog from the sides and stuff. I mean, it's it's just really cool. But yeah, it's um. so that's the neat thing about it is uh, I had people asking me, like, is this something for adults or is it something for kids? And I guess the empirical answer is that it's either or or both, you know, because I saw more adults than I did younger people with the lanterns. So I think that says a lot, too. Well, we also I don't think either of us have been to tricks and treats yet. I, I would like to think that a bunch of kids will do it during that, too. And they'll probably have a really great time. Um. So I will give this tip. It took so nobody seemed to kind of know much about the lanterns, and you know, in everyone's defense, you know, it 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 is a new product. Um, but the way that you get the lantern to work is with the interaction points. You have to face the side of the lantern with the button at the little target, and that's that's what gets it going. Um, if you face it backward or, you know, one thing that you know, in the earlier part of the video, Noah was trying to touch the bottom against it, just thinking that was more like a NFC thing than RFID. But you want to have the button facing outward. And that's where the sensor is that'll trigger the stuff. It's also how you interact with the other lanterns. And um, I'm not exactly sure how it uh, interacts with it as far as changing it to the design language of the scare zones. But it's, uh, uh, you know, you want to do you want to do it outward. but but yeah. Is there anything, you know, you mentioned the scare zones. Is there anything about these that works in the mazes? 
So in the mazes, you were instructed to turn them off. So you don't carry them, but you can carry them in the mazes. They just have to be off. Uh, Nightwalkers, I believe that you're instructed to turn them off. I've heard that it will interact with Ghouls Gone Wild, though. So I, I definitely want to try that out, you know. Now, let's talk about the durability of it. Does it seem like something that's, you know, if you went to haunt and you, you know, six times, seven times, and you brought it each time, that it's gonna, gonna hold up? Now, I, I, I present to you Exhibit A. You know, if if it can survive this guy here, Noah, the most destructive human being on Earth, it's definitely going to destruct a, you know, survive a. A responsible human being it's made of metal and plastic he dropped it several times i know that the bubble wands had some issues where if they just got bumped the wrong way they they would stop were operating properly but this didn't seem to have that issue he dropped it once when we were leaving in the parking lot um to the point where it fell and rolled a little bit so it took a big tumble then and um he uh i mean he and his sister got in a little tiff over it and they were both pulling on it, it it's I really for for a novelty item, it actually is a pretty durable device. Yeah, so this is for, like this is Noah's lantern, not your own, right? Right. So, do you plan on buying your own? Yeah, I was actually going to buy one on Saturday because we did this on Friday, but then I ended up meeting up with Noah and his family, and he had the lantern, so I just got kind of got distracted. But I certainly want to buy one. I want to have the experience for myself, um, and it's like such a cool little keepsake, you know. I mean. This is, you know, just kind of like a sketch, I think, that we're, we're showing on the screen. But it is an accurate representation. And it's such a neat thing. Um, my friend Todd, who lives in Orlando, uh, had mentioned last year that he um, he really wanted to get one from Knott's Berry Farm. He said that they were the coolest thing ever, but had made the decision that since they were going to be going through mazes and stuff, he just didn't want to carry it all night. By the time he left, it was sold out. So I found one online for like a hundred and something dollars, by the way, and bought it and gave it to him for Christmas. And I remember even with the Knott's one, and I'd never, I've never been to Knott's Scary Farm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking like, this is really cool. Like, I, I really wish I, I could buy another one to keep it, but um, I really want it just to have. It's awesome. You know? <laughs> this, like I said, looks really cool. looks like something that you have to have when you're going to Halloween hunt, you know, as um hearing you talk and, and seeing the video, everything looks, you know, impressive with it. Do um, you think this is something though, that it's going to be like the Nobu where every year you have to buy a new lantern? Um, I'm guessing not. I think that would be a bit of a stretch because I mean, the Nobu's light up and then the batteries go bad eventually. And I think they're like not replaceable batteries. And then in one way, that's like kind of how they get you, but it's also kind of like a logistical thing. I would like to think that these will probably work in the future. But with that being said, like if they just upgraded the technology, then who's to say that in two years they don't do it again and then these don't work. But for 40 bucks, I mean, it, I know that it's a lot of money to a lot of people, but it's not an investment. It's a novelty. And even if it ends up not working next year, then... What's the big deal? What I do hope is though that they change all the um, interaction points pretty often. You know, keep some of the highlights and keep on plussing it and, and stuff, and you know, make it even more interactive. And one of the the conversations that we kept on having was about the throw in terms of you scan the one by the Son of Beast station, and the Son of Beast station is part of the interaction, which is like sixty to eighty feet from you. You scan the one up in the front of the park. Um, and the eyes on the tower blink or change color. And that's, you know, 300, 400 feet from you. So I'd like to see more big stuff. I, I was talking to, you know, one of the techs and they were like, you know, the technology is there for anything. Because I was joking that, you know, you should scan it and then the, the eyes blink and it makes the spotlights on the I, I International Street go. And he's like, yeah, we just, we just chose not to do that. Like we could totally do that. So anything is possible in the future, you know, and plus with some of the talent they have there, it's just completely limitless. Um, well, let's talk about that talent they have there, you know, with the tech team, entertainment team. I know when this product was first announced that, you know, there was a lot of excitement, you know, they were you know, really looking forward to, to seeing how this worked and what the guests, you know, were going to think about it. Um, have you heard anything from anybody that, uh, you know, that 
from the park about it? Um, no, I mean, I, as far as from the park is concerned, um, I don't really, what have I mean that. by that is, you know, you walk, you walk around and people know who you are. Right. So, I mean, do any of them come up, they see you with the lantern. Hey Ryan, you know, how's it working for you? Anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I had uh, one of the tech people talk to me and, you know, I was, uh, part of it was, it was brand new. So like, they were literally walking around with a lantern, making sure all the things work. But um, it, it's, uh, I, I guess like they wouldn't have seen me with the lantern because it was Noah that had the lantern. But I imagine if I walked around with it, there would be some people asking. But, you know, with that being said, it's the first weekend. You remember the bubble wands at Winterfest? You know, it was like they came up with these things and it was like you and I were the ones that really kind of uncovered it because they didn't say anything about it. And then, you know, as Winterfest progressed, a lot more people bought them. I, I, it, this started off much stronger than the bubble wands, but I imagine that, you know, you saw them here and there last weekend. By, you know, November, you're going to see them everywhere. Yeah, it, it seems like a great product. And, you know, like I said, just saw a lot of, a lot of people with them on Friday night, the opening of Halloween Hunt with them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll see more, you know, in the weeks ahead. And, uh, it's something that, you know, I'm tempted to get one, you know, just because it just seems like you had so much fun with it, Ryan. We really did. I mean, like I said, we we spent three or four hours playing with it, um, you know, just going around trying to find the interaction points. And then mm -hmm. not all of them are the same, you know, it, even for the, the bubble wand at Winterfest, it was like some of them lit up lights, some of them shot bubbles, but they were all essentially the same thing. You can freaking make the eyes on the Eiffel Tower change with these things. I mean, how cool is that? There's one part where a phone rings and you have to interact with somebody on the phone. I, it's just, there's a lot, you know, and I, you know, I threw together the footage of the things that we that did it. This, there's like probably 20 interaction points for Halloween Haunt. Maybe that showed nine of them or so. But I really think that um, you can make a good night out of it and it, it can be a really fun time. Yeah, I definitely want to follow up on this, you know, as you get to experiment with it, you know, a little bit more. And as we get some guests, you know, some comments from our listeners, you know, whether it's on social media or here on, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you know, if you've got the lantern, you've used it, you know, let us know what you think. Um, you know, we definitely want to do a follow up episode on this because I, I like I said, I think it changes the way to do Halloween Haunt with this. Um, it definitely adds something to do for Halloween Haunt, just like the Winter Festival. By the way, I've heard rumblings that, and I think the exact quote was, if you think this is cool, just wait till Winterfest. So I think they have something up their sleeves. I, I, I honestly do not have any information uh, beyond that, but that's super exciting. And the bubble one was fun. It was a little fragile. That's like my only like real critique of it. But it was fun to do, but compared to the lantern thing, it's going to be kind of dry. So if they're like excited about the lantern or the, the bubble wands, um, it, I, it, the, I just imagine, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless, especially with these weird geniuses that do this stuff for the park, you know? Yeah, it just sounds, uh, you know, like a lot of fun. And, you know, now you've got me curious about what they might do. At Winterfest. Now, between the two products, now not you know, just saying it's the same as it was going to be last year with the wands. Um, which one's the better product? Uh, the lantern. The lantern does more. It's uh, it's cooler. No, there are some upsides to to the to the bubble wand. Um, it, it shoots bubbles. The lantern doesn't do that. Although that would be kind of interesting if it did. Um, and the the. The bubble wand, one thing that I really liked is that it, like, when they had the countdown for the tree lighting, it would, like, pulse with it. So it'd be 10, 9, 8. And then when they hit zero and the tree lit, it started shooting out bubbles. They don't have anything like that with the lantern. But as far as walking around the park doing the the interaction points, this is well ahead of that. Very intrigued about it. Uh, so looking forward to hearing more, you know, from you, from our listeners, uh, checking out social media about it. Uh, where in the park can you can you purchase this? Everywhere, they have them uh, in Kings Island collections. Um, they have them in um, 
the Emporium. For some reason, anytime I want to say Emporium, whether it's on the show with you or if it's in person, I always want to call it North Pole Mercantile, like it is during Winterfest. Why does that <laughs> pop? Why does that pop in my head before the word Emporium does? Um, also, similar to the Bubble Wands, they have um they have like a tent set up near mm -hmm. the Eiffel Tower where they're selling them as well. Um, I'm not sure if they've made it out to the other shops, like you know, like the Diamondback store or anything like that. But they, they have plenty of them in the front of the park where you can get them. They also have the option to purchase online, which will reserve you one if you are. I don't know the situation as far as them selling out or whatever. Uh, over the weekend, it didn't seem like that was going to be the case. Um, but if that is a concern of yours, you can always order it online and uh, go pick it up in the park. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that someone asked me. They said, with the way security is in terms of what you can bring in during Halloween haunt, is there any issues getting that through security the second time? Um, yes, a little bit. Not big deal, though. Uh, it's funny that you asked that because, um, wasn't my question was somebody else's. Well, I'd like to meet this person that's asking these gotcha questions. I'm kidding. Um, no. So, uh, Noah had reported to me when he brought it on Saturday that when he went through like the fast security lines, uh, it did beep. It was too much metal. So they made him go through like where the strollers and the wheelchairs and stuff go. Uh, no issue bringing it in. Uh, security seems to know what it is and so on, but um, just know that that if you bring it back into the park, you you may beep and you may have to go through uh, a little bit of additional security. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, well, yeah, I'll definitely keep you posted. And uh, if anybody has purchased one or intends to purchase one, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. Let us know what you think. Uh, anything from you think it's a cash grab to you think that this is something that's awesome and it's the future of Han. I'm kind of leaning towards... Uh, you know, this interactive stuff using technology as like a wow moment. Um, I, I kind of want that to be the future of it. I, I know I it's do. like, you know. I do too, Ryan. I think this is really, you know, exciting. And, you know, they're probably just scratching the surface on what they can do with this. So, yeah, I'm, I'm real excited about it. And, you know, I'm looking forward to how they continually improve this, you know, in, in the years ahead because, you're right. It's probably the future of Han is to make it a more interactive experience. You can never go wrong when you make things that are interactive with your guests. Well, and, and the thing, though, is I don't want to have an argument in the comments of uh, this makes Haunt an upcharge, kind of like, you know, Top Thrill 2 was an upcharge because you had to buy a locker. But I don't think that that's a, a, an argument that that really holds water because with Top Thrill 2, like, I can't even wear my Apple Watch. Like, uh, I've got cellular on my Apple Watch. Even if I elected not to bring my phone to the park, I wouldn't be able to wear my watch on Top Thrill 2. I'd have to buy a locker. So that's a cash grab as far as I'm concerned. This, on the other hand, you still have Haunt. You still got the houses. You still got the scare zones. You still got the shows. But if you want to have that little extra experience, especially for somebody that visits a lot, I think that's a really cool option to have. You know, it is. It's, uh, I use. I look at it, Ryan, as a way to elevate your experience. You know, kind of like if you want to get fast lane, it's a way to make the most of your day, right? So there's all these different options that you can choose to add to enhance your experience, and this is one of them. Yeah, I mean, I I, I see it as kind of akin to. Um, yeah, you're not being forced to get it. If right. You right. Get it, well, think of it like when they used to do. I mean, they haven't in a while, but like the international restaurant buffets for like carnival mm -hmm. and winterfest and stuff when it used to be i mean you could use your meal plan but if you want to have a little bit better experience you can fork out a few bucks and and do it you know uh, no one's forcing you to do it it's not like now a meal costs 40 dollars, but if you want to do the buffet and have the good view and stuff you can go up there and do it so i think options are a good thing um plus if this thing is a good generator for haunt for for you know people and i'm included where i feel like a lot of the mentality of the park is we open the gates. It's all season pass holders. They come no matter what. If it really starts generating a lot of new revenue and stuff, that's an enticing case for making general investments in the product as well. Exactly. Cool. All right. So enough about lanterns. Let's talk about t-shirts. Speaking of cash grabs. <laughs> <laughs> it is for us, right? Uh, right. Tower Topic t-shirts, they come in a Carolina blue get any size that you want just $22 that does include shipping so it's a great deal all you need to do if you're interested in one is just message us on 
our X, which is tower underscore topics, not just messages, but make sure you follow us too there. And uh, if you don't have X, you can reach out to us, you know, comment if you're watching on YouTube and, you know, we'll reach out to you there. You can send an email through um, themeparksbydon.com. Any way that you need to get in touch with us, you can you can do that. And once we have heard from you, we'll send you the QR code. Once the transaction goes through, it's just a matter of day before you get your shirt. And a uh, very comfortable shirt. You'll love it. Yeah, $22, including shipping. We've been seeing a lot of them out there. Uh, it's so flattering for us to see people wear these T-shirts. Uh, it's flattering enough when people come. I had somebody come up to me. I held the door for him at, uh, and, uh, at the Coke Freestyle. And they're like, oh, hey, Ryan. And I was like, hey, because I'm really bad with faces and names. So there are people that I worked with for like 10 years. And they'll come up and start talking to me. And I have to, in context, figure out who they are. So when people say, hey, Ryan, I just kind of like, I'm like, hey. And I assume that they know me. But they were like, you don't know me. But you and Don are on my TV all the time. And I'm like, ah, I know who <laughs> Yeah. But um, I tried to the, – the, they said to their kids um, – do you know who this is? And they didn't. And I said, I'm Mr. Beast. And they didn't believe me. I guess I don't look like a 25 year old kid from North Carolina. <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, I tell my wife the other day, somebody had mentioned to me that Monday nights, you know, they're not football fans or anything. So they're not watching Monday night football. So, but what they do, you know, the family, husband, wife, the two kids is they watch our last three episodes, you know, most recent three episodes on you. You know, YouTube, watch it on the big screen, you know, at home. And, uh, you know, my wife said, that's just sad <laughs> that people would do that. But, uh, no, we appreciate everybody that, you know, watches or listens or, you know, follows us on our social channels, interacts with us, sees us in the park and says hello. Um, you know, it means a lot to us. Do you find it as hurtful as I do that we get people that we don't know that come up to us and, like, you know, we're, they're glad to meet us. We're glad to meet them. They thank us for, for doing this show. You know, we thank them for making the show worth doing because they listen. Um, yet our significant others, my girlfriend and your wife think it's stupid that people like want to meet us. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I wouldn't use the word stupid, but I, I think they're kind of uh, bewildered my, by it. My you know, girlfriend that uses the word stupid. She's like, I don't understand. No, my why my wife just people want like to come up and say hi to you because you're a stupid podcast. <laughs> no, she's she's just puzzled, you know, by that or will be somewhere, you know, and, and someone will come up and say, Tower Topics, love the show, you know, that kind of thing. Or before that, it was, you know, because of what I was doing with the racer and that. So she's kind of been used to it in a lot of ways, but this is different because it's a different audience. Um, that we yeah, get now here, you're but... now you're playing backseat to me as the celebrity that's the difference yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and um it, it it's you know the one thing now i will say this and you know you mentioned um you know about our our audience and that you know without fans of the show you know ryan and i wouldn't be doing the show you know we, oh, yeah. we you know we are king's island fans uh, and we're doing this for Kings Island fans. We want this to be a channel where you get, you know, some park information, different insights, um, you get our experiences, some of the stories that we can tell from park history and that, that, that we can become that, um, you know, place for you, uh, you know, in the social space, you know, YouTube, wherever to, you know, if you love Kings Island, you know, that, uh, you know, you enjoy what we're doing and, and that we become part of your, you know, your, your, your King's Island, um, you know, way of getting information. Yeah. I mean, I still, I, I feel like in my head, I'm still at the thought process of everybody that watches us or listens to us is somebody I know. So when somebody comes up to me like, oh, hey, Ryan, I love Tower Topics. I'm like, really? Who put you up to this? <laughs> you know? So, so I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really cool and I'm very appreciative of it. So if anybody sees, you know, obviously either of us out there and you want to come up and say hi, like by all means, I'm not doing anything important. You know? <laughs> no, no, we, we enjoy that interacting with our guests and, and our guests, but our audience. And we want, um, you know, we want to interact back with you. We want to do more things, you know, out and about, you know, we've had a meetup that we did, about a year ago at Entertainment Junction. We want to do more of those kind of things. We did a meetup at Kings Island toward the end of Grand Carnival. So more of those kind of things to, to get people, uh, like-minded people, 
And what I mean by like-minded people, like-minded people that love King's Island, we want to, you know, if we can get those little, you know, small group gatherings, you know, 20, 30, 40 people, whatever it might be at a different time. And we're just all kind of hanging out at the park, just talking about the park or maybe what we just saw with the parade, whatever, anything like that. Uh, you know, there's going to be some pretty cool things uh, to look forward to in the future. Not to mention, um, in, you know, we've talked about this kind of openly, so I, I don't think that this is a huge secret, but uh, one of our short-term goals, and this will probably be an off-season thing, is to go on location, record the podcast somewhere, and then if people want to show up, watch us record the show live, uh, and then maybe we'll grab some people and we can talk about their experience riding the bath or the vortex or, or whatever. You know, a couple what I mean? weeks ago, a couple weeks ago on an episode, someone asked us about doing a show at Mount Lookout Tavern. Mm -hmm. Well, I can report that attempts to reach out to uh, look Mount Lookout Tavern were unsuccessful. <laughs> Did not get a return call or anything. So uh, we'll keep trying. Though. Down with Mount Lookout Tavern. All right. We'll be right back with the listener questions. All right, first listener question, Linda B. from Cincinnati, Ohio. Last year around this time, the 2024 operating calendar, calendar was released. When do you think we'll see the 2025 operating calendar? I want to say, wasn't it like early November? When it was, was it released, I don't think I don't think it I don't think it was in September, October. I want to say it was early November when it was released, and it wasn't really the full calendar yet. Uh, there was like a week missing in August, and you know, yeah, in August that was missing. So it looked yeah. like they were going to close on August twelfth, and it turned out like two or three months later that that week was filled in. So whatever does get released, don't panic if there's you know some dates missing in that because there's you know they still have to work some things out sometimes you don't know this early when the school year is going to start that has a lot to do with when daily operation is going to end is is when kids go back to school it seems to get a little earlier every year unfortunately uh, but i would say you know maybe look for it in november that was the earliest that it had been released you know in in for a long time, really, was was it coming out that early last year? Normally, it was uh, mid to late January when when that would come out. But with the merger with Six Flags, you know, everything's off the table. Just because they did it last year doesn't mean that they would again. Uh, so we'll see. But it's nice to know with season passes on sale, especially if you're looking to get those either renew for next year at this time, or you're looking to get them as gifts for somebody. It's nice to know, you know, what you're buying you know, in terms of how many operating days and that, that they, they might have to look at, you know, knowing again that there might be, you know, some more added. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the earlier the better, but who knows with the merger, when it might come out. Yeah, um, I, I would, if I had to guess, and let's take the merger out of the equation, although it undoubtedly will play some sort of role. Um, it seemed like the park, the way that they communicate now, they have the thought process of, I don't want you thinking about 2020 five because we've got haunt coming in 2024 and so on and part of pr is doing that but if i had to guess i would say probably a little bit after winterfest opens is when they will release the full calendar um they may release opening day before that i know historically i think when you were with the park they would announce oh, yeah, april 19th is opening day but the calendar wouldn't be released until you know much later right. um are you do you have any concerns about the operating calendar next year do you think it'll be yes. kind of the same as this year? <laughs> I, I do because, you know, there's still going to be some tightening of the belt. So I, I don't know what that means. It might mean some shorter hours, you know, some days in August or in the early spring where the park might be, you know, 10 to 6 instead of 10 to 8. You know, some things like that. So, yeah, a little bit concerning just because, you know, the merger and, you know, it, it, there's going to be, you know, looking for ways you know, to make some cuts without really impacting, you know, the guest experience as much as they, as they can. So, you know, an hour or two here and there, one way to go about it. So, yeah, a little bit concerned. Don't know if they'll do that, but I do know what they did at some of the, the Six Flags parks before the merger where some of them were closed on, you know, during the week. Yeah, like Tuesdays. Days. Yeah. Yeah, Six Flags over Texas used to be open daily. They were closed on Tuesday. So I hope it doesn't get to that point. I hope that it gets to the point to where, all the parks are open, you know, seven days a week, but it all remains to be seen. 
my biggest fear is, uh, you know, when it comes down to consumer behavior, um, a lot of times consumers teach companies what can be tolerated. And one of the things that I feel like that the people have demonstrated is that it's okay for them to close at nine o'clock during the spring. And the reason why they close at nine, uh, part of it is, you know, saves them a little bit of money, but also the fireworks show is a lot more expensive with the drones so that it saves them, you know, about 10 of those by staying up until nine, because, you know, every night the parks up until 10 or later, there's, there's fireworks. Well, my concern is that if, if there's a real pinch, you might see Sunday through Thursday, we close at nine Friday and Saturday, we close at 10. Oh, and there's fireworks on Friday and Saturday. Yeah. I, that, that's yeah, or big... some are some openings at 11 o'clock. You do see some parks in the chain that open at 11. Yeah. You know, so like that hour there, you know, actually it'd be like 90 minutes because you open the gates, you know, at 930. So, yeah, I mean, there could be a lot of a lot of little things like that. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's an interesting time, you know, for the company, not just for, you know, the guests, but I think also internally there's a lot of. You know what's going to happen how are they going to you know realign you know the different uh, departments and things who's going to be doing what where they're going to be doing it from so uh, you know there's a lot to, a lot out there that's going to change both externally and internally over the next you know six to ten months so stay tuned and then we'll report all about it all right Next listener question, Nathan W. from Westchester, Ohio. He said, I'm looking to renew my gold pass with the All Park Passport, All Park Fast Lane, and Dining Plan. If I renew for through Canada's Wonderland, I can save a substantial amount of money. Should I go that route? You know, um, I think if with all those different products, if you renew through Canada's Wonderland, you probably would save around like maybe about $300, 250 to 300 dollars yeah around 300 dollars so i think what you have to do if that's what you're thinking about you know it would be it's business you know not personal on where you bought your pass you got to make a business decision on on uh what, what you want to do there but 300 dollars is 300 dollars and that's that's not a small amount of money if it was 20 bucks, 25 bucks, like right. you'd be crazy to to do that because you could run into risk. But for $300, I know somebody that did this. Now, if you're and, a family of four, you know, now you're looking at over a thousand dollars that yeah. you can save doing that. Now, I want to throw this out there. Uh, I, we've brought this up before, but I, I think this is a good segue into another point as to the, which park to renew from and maybe to, to wait. Um, remember that with Top Thrill 2, you had to be a Cedar Point Gold Pass yes. or Cedar Point Prestige Pass holder. So part of the reason why I'm kind of waiting, to, to be honest with you, is if the situation is going to be like, oh, Cedar Point Gold Pass uh, gets to ride their new tilt coaster first or whatever, that's a case to buy it through them instead. You know, if they're going to play that game, we should play it too. Oh, also, same thing. you got Kings Dominion, you've got Canada's Wonderland, you've got Cedar Point. Uh, Six Flags, you know, Great American Chicago is opening a new coaster. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, things like that that could be in play. So even though you're going to save a little bit of money by renewing right now, you know, if you're interested in those kind of things, attending, you know, media day events and that or being part of pass holder events, you know, by all means, I think, uh, you know, sit tight and just wait to see, you know, what passes work where for what, you know, going mm. into the 2025 season. Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, unfortunately, I, I I don't want, if anyone's from Kings Island or Cedar Fair is listening, I, I, I understand that you hate me right now for this, but the fact of the matter is you're asking us to purchase a product, in his case, a very expensive product uh, without knowing exactly what he's buying, you know? So if they were very clear that, Okay, we're gonna have a preview day for um, you know, the new Cedar Point roller coaster and maybe top throw through two is thrown in there too, something like that. We can make a purchasing decision based on that. Same with the Canada's Wonderland coaster, which looks amazing, and the Six Flags Chicago one that looks amazing. But the thing that was without knowing, then the best advice that we're able to give is to wait and see what product you're gonna get. You know, I'm not a big fan of, you know, on the internet, they buy, I bought a $10,000 mystery box. Let's find out what's inside. 
I'm totally not that guy. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm the, no, I'm the do tons of research and do every little thing and look at the competition and read the reviews. I'm that kind of guy. So that's why I often hold off. It's also, you know, as far as like a Kings Island pass is concerned, like there's probably never going to be a condition in which I make the election not to have a Kings Island pass of some sort. But I always mentally wait until not long before the season um, starts because there's always that thought of like, well, what if they're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays? And I just don't want to participate this year. I probably yeah, but if you if you'd have known the rules for for top thrill too, you might have renewed through Cedar Point had you known the rules in advance. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, like that would have been something I would have considered. In fact, I didn't buy the all park passport because, well, actually, I I didn't, and I was gonna. Bought, I bought my pass and I was going to add the all park passport upon deciding to go to another park. I just, I never ended up going to another Cedar fair park, but if I had known that, that as a Cedar point gold pass holder, I would have bought the Cedar point. Pa- or at least I may have bought the Cedar point pass and the all park passport just to go to that event. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like I said, I want to know mm-hmm. what I'm buying, but since we're left out in the cold and, you know, we get a lot of promises and stuff, but we've also had a lot of times when the language on the website was changed, you know, or, you know, this bombshell of Top Thrill 2 was dropped upon us where it's like, oh, only Cedar Park. Well, I thought the All Park Passport was just like the Platinum Pass. Well, it's not. I don't know where you got that from. Uh, you, we got it from your website. But yeah, I hate to give the advice that you should wait or you should buy it from a different park. But sometimes that's the best decision for you, you know. Yeah, but think of it this way too. I mean, you, you know, three hundred dollars in savings. If you're interested in going to some other parks outside of the chain too, you could use that three hundred dollars. You could buy season passes for, you know, two other parks maybe. Exactly. Uh, with that savings, if you really wanted to. So I mean, it's something to look at, something to consider. But I think it comes down to you just have to make a business decision, and do what's best for you. Right. And that might be saving three hundred dollars. But yeah, yeah, I, 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 don't, uh, yeah I, I really don't intend to be like a jerk and I don't want to be like come off as like negative towards the park or encourage people not to buy a pass because it's, that's certainly not my intention. But the fact of the matter is the people at Cedar Point got a way better deal than the people at Kings Island did. And it's quite yeah, possible we, that's going to happen again next year. You know? Yeah, well, you have to make a business decision, you know, do what's best for you. And for some people that would be, you know, that $300 is going to be a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, for other people, it's just uh, you know the convenience of it. Let's just you know keep renewing from Kings Island. That's where we've always got it. You know, so it just depends on you know what's what's best for you. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's stop this before we get in any more trouble. I'm Ryan Sir, along with Don Helbig, and this is Tower Topics. <laughs>